From 2011 to 2012, uh, I spent a year in service with City Year in Washington, D.C. City Year is an organization that basically takes young people and puts them in schools, in struggling schools, as tutors and mentors. So as you can imagine, it was very tough work and sometimes very grueling work to do. Now, City Year uh, is, gets a good bit of its funding and um, it, it is through the service organization uh, AmeriCorps, uh, through the National Corporation of Service. So being a national service, obviously there's no religious affiliations with this group. And as somebody at the time who was discerning a call to ministry, it was really important for me to have that grounding, to have that grounding in my faith. So it was very important for me to make sure that I was attending a good church. So I went to a place that was very near to where I lived, just outside uh, D.C. proper, just outside the city. Now... This church, a lot of the sermons that were preached there were about how all we need to do is go out there and do good works, and we're going to be okay. I remember sitting there thinking with a lot of these sermons, well, I'm doing that. I'm putting in 40 to 60 hour weeks with these kids, trying to help them get through their studies to actually make it through school. I'm doing all this. I'm spending all my time on this. There's not much else going on in my life aside from this. And I feel like I need something more. I thought, I'm doing everything you're telling me to do. But there's still something missing. This is where we find ourselves in our reading from Galatians this morning. Paul talks about the law. The law alone cannot save us. The law alone is not what justifies us. Paul talks about it as a disciplinarian. And without getting into all the historical context of what that means, basically it's like uh, in kindergarten. When you have time out and you've got gold stars to reward you for good behavior. The law is there to help prepare us. To help be a guide when we're young and when we need it. But what Paul is saying is it's just that first step. The law alone is not what we need. What we need is Jesus. Now, having Jesus there and having a deeper relationship with Jesus, with God, it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of time. That's where we are in our reading with Elijah from the Tanakh this morning. So Elijah in this story has just defeated the prophets of Baal. He's defeated them in this contest to prove which God is actually God. Is it Baal or is it the Lord? And spoiler alert, the Lord wins out. And so Jezebel, the queen, is really, really unhappy. And as sort of the classic villain, she puts out basically a bounty on Elijah's head. So he runs away scared and unsure of what's going to happen to him, whether he's going to survive this ordeal. At this point in time, Elijah had gotten a little cocky. Yes, he had this great fervor and zeal for the Lord, which is good and helpful. But he was so sure of himself that uh, during this contest, he uh, was a little bit braggy uh, and 
that may have had some effect on Jezebel's choice to go after him. So Elijah's really in need of some spiritual renewal. He really needs to be made more firm in his life with God. And so God uh, calls him out and leads him to Horeb, this mountain which so often in the Tanakh is a place where the Israelites go to hear, to listen, and to be with God. This is what uh, we sometimes call one of those thin places for the Israelites, where God just seems a little bit more present than normal. So God leads him to this place. And there's wind and earthquake and fire. These things that you think would be the full majesty of God. But God's not in those. God's in what we heard this morning, which is a very good translation of what we hear there. The sound of sheer silence. That's where God is present. Where there's nothing else left to distract us from hearing God. That's where God is. When nothing else prevents us from hearing God, from being with God. That presence with God is transformative. It's what we see in the gospel today. We see this unnamed man who's running around naked in the midst of the tombstones because he's been possessed. Because he's been filled by those evil things that try to fill in that hole in our lives. But Jesus comes. Jesus comes and frees him from those things, transforms his life, so that he's no longer this crazy naked man running around these tombstones. But now, now this man is sitting there at the feet of Jesus ready to learn. This is a powerful transformation. So much so that the people around in the village are frightened. They don't know how to react to this. They're scared because of this great change. For some of us at times, there's an emptiness that we experience in our lives. We try to fill that in different ways. Sometimes that may be doing everything that we can to do good, to do what we think we need to do to follow the rules. And yet, there's still something missing in all of that. Sometimes we try to feel, fill that void by having that righteous zeal. But even then, we still need a further and more full relationship with the divine. It may be that we fill that void with bad and evil things. And those ultimately don't sustain us, but can end up destroying us. What we really need to fill that emptiness, to fill that void that we all feel in our lives sometimes, that void that we need to fill, that we feel. What we need to do that, what we need to fill the void, is a greater and deeper relationship with the divine. What we really need to fill that void is a relationship, a deeper relationship, relationship with Jesus Christ. This is not always easy, and our journey in this time is not always a rosy one. We see that a little bit of that journey in our psalms this morning. In Psalm 42, we get to the end in this negative space, wondering where 
God is, and yet still trying to cling on. And that's why we end with Psalm 43, because we get a little bit more hope there. We get that same refrain, but we still get more hope. The hope of God being there in our trials. The hope of clinging to God more fully. The hope that God is there to help us through those times of trouble. There's nothing we can do in our own lives to make them more full or to make them better. Thank goodness we don't have to. That's what Jesus is there for. When acting the best we can isn't good enough, Jesus is there to help transform us and help make us to actually be better. When our zeal and our righteousness leave us empty, Jesus is there to transform us, to develop a deeper relationship in us so that we know why it is we have that righteous zeal in our lives. And in those times where the darkness seems to overtake us, Jesus is there with us also. There with us present on the cross in the deepest and darkest of our moments, there to be with us, there to guide us, there to walk with us and help us through those times. There are many times in our lives where we need something more, where we want something more. And thank goodness in those times that we have Jesus there to walk the journey with us, to be present with us, to be with us in both the good times and the bad.